one well, went to his uh, friends, uh, his associates, and another one that seems capable of killing two people and passing off for years and years a number of forgeries, who was capable of a lot of dirty deals uh, and deception. Linda Silito has written, is writing a book about Hoffman. He's a confusing man. What, is, what are your opinions? What is he really like? What's his personality, Linda? Well, one thing we're beginning to see consistently with Mark Hoffman is that he had an uncanny knack of being able to perceive um, people's desires and their biases and being able to use those toward his own end, regardless of, of what they were or um, what position those people were in. Was he very... He must have been very cold-blooded if he was able to not only murder... Uh, uh, one person, uh, Christensen, but also another p person, Kathy Sheets, just to cover up the first m murder. Well, both the... Where's his conscience? I don't know where his conscience is, but um, both the murders and the forgeries are, are in some ways cold-blooded. The murders especially because they take human life. But in some ways, I think that there's a consistency there in that all of the crimes are very passive and uh, have a terrific impact. Um, murders, years and years of forgeries and deception, and Mark Hoffman, today on Talk About. From Broadcast House in Salt Lake City, Talk About, with Shelley Osterloh. Good morning, I'm Shelley Osterloh, and this is Talk About. Mark Hoffman recently pleaded guilty to two counts of second-degree murder so that the first-degree murder charges against him would be dropped. Now, first-degree murder carries with it a possibility of, uh, of death sentence. He, Mark Hoffman was sentenced to one prison term of five years to life and three other prison terms of one to 15 years. Now, one of the conditions within, under the plea bargain was that Mark Hoffman would tell the truth about the bombings, about the forgeries, about the deception and deals that he had, he had done over the years. Alan Roberts is, is uh, also writing a book about Hoffman. Can we believe this man who has lied for so many years? Are we now suddenly supposed to believe that he's going to tell the truth about all these deals? Willie? I think we have to be very skeptical given his history of uh, deception and lying. He's certainly the consummate liar. On the other hand, he has to look at his own life, realize that he'll, he'll be in prison for a long time, especially if he's not cooperative. So it seems like there is some incentive for him to be forthcoming uh, because it will go on his record as, as a positive thing. Uh, as, uh, as Brett and I were just discussing, Mark has had to do all of this alone and hasn't really had an outlet for, uh, for telling, uh, bragging about all of the accomplishments of his. And so maybe this is a time for him to get it off his chest uh, I hope they'll tell the truth, and I think the police have enough information to verify, in most cases, whether he is telling the truth. But on the other hand, he, he's, he's had an ingrained uh, lifetime um, of, of lying and deceiving, and I don't know really if he's even capable of ultimately telling the truth. You mentioned he was going to be in prison for a long time. Do you think he really will be, or is he going to be up before the, the parole board in seven or ten years and be out? Well, he probably will be up, but whether or not they allow him to... Uh, go free is another question. The judge indicated his preference that Mark spend the rest of, an, of his natural life in prison, but it's really not up to him. It's up to the uh, parole board. He, he may be a model prisoner. Uh, he has a family, uh, first-time criminal, uh, etc. On the other hand, the, the victims are, are multitudinous and the murders are grievous, and uh, I think the poll that's, that's been taken recently suggests the public outcry. The public opinion is that, uh, number one, per perhaps there shouldn't have been a plea, and secondly, he should be in there a, a good long time. I think it is also simply amazing that he managed to pull off so many forgeries, so much deception for so many years. Now, Brent Metcalf uh, knew uh, Har Hoffman or knows Hoffman personally. He's a historical researcher and a friend and associate of Mark Hoffman and one of the victims, Steve Christensen. How was he able to fool you? You're a smart person. Couldn't you see through this? Well, I, I'd like to think I have some degree of intelligence, but I, I think that, that one of the keys in understanding how people were fooled by Mark's forgeries was 
not because of their revolutionary nature and leading to historical revisionism, but rather because of the remarkable congruency that the documents Mark was producing had with the documents that were already accessible to historians. It's only on a popular level that people have seen these documents as revolutionary. To historians, I don't think that they've really understood them in those terms, and I don't think that they view them that way. Were they congruent with history? I thought that they brought up some rather uh, controversial mm -hmm aspects to history. The, the very point that you're making there, I think, is, is exactly what I'm saying, that to the lay population in general, they were somewhat revolutionary in nature. But take, for example, in the Salamander letter, the reference to the prerequisite of bringing Alvin, Joseph's brother, to the hill in order to get the plates. We have that in accounts coming from uh, Joseph Knight, from Willard Chase, from Joseph Smith Sr., from Lorenzo Saunders. This was not new to historians, but it was new to the lay population. And I think that that's why it had such an impact on the overall population was because the people were not aware of these things, and hence they took on a very sensational value in the media coverage. Well, we're going to find out more about uh, the unique personality of Mark Hoffman and the impact that he's had on his history when talk about returns. Behold the beer belly. 50 million Americans need a shortcut to get from fat to flat. Introducing the Gut Buster. It's the ultimate fitness machine specifically designed to firm and flatten the stomach as nothing else can. And ladies, if you're as serious as he is, that flat stomach you had in high school can be yours again. Basic spring-ups like these work the upper abdominal region. Reverse for tension-assisted high-risers. This sturdy unit travels easily, so you can exercise anywhere. And it's yours with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So go ahead head gut busters. If you're serious about a flat stomach, exercise your right to call toll-free now. To order your gut buster, call 1-800-445-7200. That's 1-800-445-7200. Use your credit card to avoid COD charges or send check or money order for $19.95 plus $3 shipping and handling to the gut buster, Department 362, Canton, Ohio, 44750. That toll-free number again is 1-800-445-7200. Enjoy extra sugar-free gum. You get extra flavor, extra fun, get extra sugar-free gum. Extra, the only leading sugar-free gum with NutraSweet, gives you extra refreshing flavor that lasts an extra, extra, extra long time. Extra flavor for that extra long play. Extra flavor for that extra long day. When you chew it, extra, the extra fresh flavor lasts an extra, extra, extra long time. Extra lasts extra long. One of these is a real plant. One is a no-maintenance, never-to-die, forever plant. Which is which? <coughs> At Forever Plants, you'll find forever plants, like our finest ficus, now only $79.95. Never-to-die and no upkeep. Choose from our large selection of spring arrangements. Hanging plants from $49.95. Table plants from $13.95. Brighten your life today the easy way from Forever Plants. West Valley, Provo, and Salt Lake City. Talking about Mark Hoffman, yes. What do you feel as Mark Hoffman's friend of what he had to dis had what he's promised to disclose, and do you think he'll tell the truth? Um, well, one of the frustrating things about all of this is after subsequent to the bombings. I spent quite a bit of time talking to Mark about what had happened, and he emphatically denied any involvement in the murders. He emphatically denied that he was involved in any kind of forgery, and uh, Mark kind of maintained this uncompromising reticence while others of us were having our reputations destroyed, um, including the, the families of the victims in some cases, such as Gary Sheets. And uh, I, I think from my perspective, I'm going to share the same feeling as Alan, and that is that I want to see physical evidence corroborating what, what Mark is saying. I think I would find it very difficult to simply take him at his word and say, yes, he's telling me the truth now, because being as close to him as I was, and yet having him lie about such incredible crimes is uh, beyond belief to me. Um, could Mark Hoffman been convicted of murder with the, without the evidence that he had? Do you think if he'd gone to trial on first-degree murder charges, would he have been convicted? Alan? I think there's a very good chance. Uh, 
in fact the sentencing that has been reduced uh, acts really in his benefit this this may have been the most opportune thing for him had there been a trial uh, on the on the one hand he may not have been required to testify so we may not have gotten all the information from him directly but the police have so much evidence uh, literally thousands of pieces of evidence I think I think he would have been convicted and perhaps the sentencing would have been um, greater than it ended up being in the plea bargain. How much influence do you think that the church had in getting him to plead guilty? Linda? Um, that's something that, that we watched very carefully because we knew that the Hoffman family <coughs> are um, devout members of the church and of course Mark had had a relationship with several church leaders and as far as we can tell the church didn't have an influence in um, bringing about the plea bargain. It was more a matter of, of politics within the county attorney's office, personalities, the risk of taking such a complicated case before a jury, even though having sat through the preliminary hearing and knowing some of the evidence that's come up since the preliminary hearing, it seemed to me that Hoffman would be convicted. There's always a risk when you have a jury. And I know that the prosecutors were worried about that risk, and they were worried about some of the unanswered questions, like the motive for the um, second bomb and the third bomb. And so, for that reason, uh, there were, you know, there, there were some problems that they had to consider. But the church seemed to realize that uh, the more public this became, the better the, the church as an institution appeared. And as far as we can tell, stayed out of, of all of that um, bargaining that went back and forth. There's, Linda, so, there's you, some indication that yes. the tr some church figures may have actually preferred that there be a trial because it would have shown that the entire responsibility rested on the shoulders of Mark Hoffman and that the church's involvement was minor and that the uh, documents, all of the charges, had they been uh, uh, decided on at a trial, we would not have the confusion we do now about not knowing about 26 of the charges. So there would have been some real advantages for the church. The disadvantage would be that some of the church figures would have had to go on the stand and testify publicly, and there, there's a little bit of embarrassment associated with that. But overall, I think uh, the church would have come out all right on it. Now, you mentioned the 26 uh, other documents that there were uh, accusations that they were forgeries, but no one knows now. What are we waiting to find out about? Are we waiting for Mark Hoffman to say, yes, indeed, I forged that one and that's how I did it? Well, the preliminary hearing presented information on those documents and uh, a great amount of, uh, for me anyway, compelling forensics evidence was advanced to show that those documents are forgeries. So even though he hasn't confessed to them, uh, I think the opinion is of the police and uh, my personal opinion is that none of the significant documents Hoffman produced is authentic. Linda, you mentioned that his families uh, are devout Mormons. Is he? Is Mark Hoffman a believer? One thing I learned uh, the night that Mark Hoffman was injured and that I came on the story was that Mark was perceived very differently by different people and that some people perceived him as, as an active Mormon. Um, some, most of his friends told me that Mark was not a believer, that he stayed in the church for family and business reasons, which of course many people do. And, you know, I, that, that does not make a murderer, and I don't want to imply that it does. Um, I, the, Mark and Dory Hoffman and their children are connected to the ward, and they have a lot of support in that ward, and a lot of friends in their neighborhood, um, whatever their personal beliefs are. But there seems to be, Mark at least seemed to have uh, withdrawn a lot of his personal feelings toward the church and especially toward its theology. You have some interesting insights also, I think, into the, the specific techniques that Mark Hoffman used to dupe so many people. We'll find out about that when Talk About Returns. <laughs> Tomorrow on Talk About, meet Salt Lake's most popular radio talk show hosts, including Fred Wicks. Thursday and Friday, attention deficit syndrome and hyperactivity. Hi, this is Dennis James. You know, Physicians Mutual has just taken a major step toward eliminating the number one concern of people aged 65 or over. And that concern is the rising amount of health care costs that neither Medicare nor traditional Medicare supplement policies pay. But that's all about to change now. 
because now there's total care from Physicians Mutual. The Medicare supplement policy that pays every penny of every bill not fully paid by Medicare. That's right. As long as Medicare pays part, Total Care will pay the rest right down to the last cent. Now, I want you to write down this important toll-free number and then call it to get this free information kit. Total Care Policy. But first, let me tell you a little more about it. You see, unlike other policies that pay only up to Medicare's allowable charge, Total Care pays you the total difference between what Medicare pays and your actual bill. Now, you may hear of other plans that sound similar, but I'm telling you right now, with Total Care, there's a big difference. In fact, only Total Care pays every penny of your Medicare co-payments, every penny of your hospital bills for one year after Medicare benefits end, and every penny of your medical expenses not fully paid by Medicare. Here's another important difference. There are no deductibles, none. There's no waiting period, none. Your total care benefits will start immediately. You're fully covered the minute your policy is issued. Look, to learn more about this really remarkable plan, call this toll-free number and receive all the facts by mail. The information is free, so is the call. There's no obligation on your part whatsoever. Don't spend another minute worrying about health care costs. Call this number now. You'll be glad that you did. We're here when you need us. Physicians Mutual. I want to tell you about an upcoming topic uh, uh, that we're going to be doing a taping on. We're going to discuss AIDS education in Utah. Are you for changing sex education programs in Utah schools? Would you like them changed, or are you against it? Are you concerned about how that uh, AIDS and sex education may be taught in the schools? If you feel one way or the other, we'd like to hear from you. And as always, the number to call is KSL 5678 for information about that taping and reservations to come down and be part of our Talk About audience. Right now we're talking about uh, Mark Hoffman. You had something you wanted to add about uh, Mark Hoffman's religious beliefs. Well, well my Brent? experience with... Um, Mark, just to be perhaps a little bit more descriptive uh, than Linda, is that, that Mark was essentially um, atheistic in his beliefs. And uh, I don't want to imply by that, however, that somehow atheism is attached to uh, the crimes that he committed any more than a belief in God is attached to the crimes that the Lafferty's committed. And so I think that we need to have caution in how we use that information. But I think it is important for understanding Mark's uh, frame of reference on different issues of life and death and that kind of thing. I, I think that it does have meaning in that context. Linda, how did he manage? What were the techniques that he used to convince the people around him that the documents that he had forged were indeed real documents, historical documents? Well, for most of um, Mark Hoffman's career, and to some degree all the way through, although this evolved, this technique evolved as he went along, we see him um, being the lucky and, uh, and fortunate discoverer of a number of um, remarkable finds. And Mark tended to be the last one to make any claims for the document. It was more a matter of, look what I found. You know, what do you think this is? And then the other person would say, this looks like the anthem transcript, or, you know, this is the Joseph Smith the Third blessing, or whatever it was. And Mark was usually the first to suggest authentication procedures. He approached people in terms of their own beliefs and their own biases with different documents. Uh, an example of that is the McClellan Collection, who for Al Rust, a uh, former bishop and a businessman, was very valuable but not very controversial. For um, Elder Hugh Pinnock, who was concerned about the institutional church and its image, it, it was very controversial and could be very damaging. Um, and so, and in fact, it, it evidently wasn't anything at all. And so, as Alan and I have interviewed victims, we found certain patterns emerging where the same techniques are used over and over again. And uh, that's helped us understand a lot about Mark Hoffman. Well, I, and I would add that I think that the siege mentality that exists in some circles of the Mormon church contributed significantly to create a, a conducive atmosphere for Mark to perpetrate these frauds because he was literally, as Linda and Alan pointed out earlier, meeting the needs of his victims. And this is exactly how he did it, in accomplishing his own desires and his own goals 
by meeting the needs of others in the process. How was he able to sell these papers they didn't have? For example, the McClellan papers. They still, th at this time, we still don't the, know that they ever exist. The, the McClellan collection, I think, had a particularly unique position, and that is, is that it came after literally a, a plethora of documents had come forth from Mark that people had seen, that had been authenticated, and Mark, I think, had gained the implicit trust of numerous people. And as a result, he basically presented it to him. I've got this collection. It's in the works. I don't have it yet, but it's, it's coming. And I think he was very persuasive in that way. He had me convinced. He had Steve Christensen convinced. He had several general authorities convinced. And I think it was because of his track record prior to that in literally producing documents. Why did St Steve, how did Steve Christensen find out that those McClellan papers may have been a forgery? I mean, that's what he was killed for because he supposedly threatened to expose Hoffman? I, I personally don't believe no. that. I, I don't believe that Steve why ever was he, knew. Why I, was he killed? Well, we think that he was killed because uh, he was insisting that Mark consummate the McClellan transaction. Uh, he was insisting that Mark pay back the bank loan, which was overdue, and which Steve had helped Mark get through a church general authority, who was also a bank director, but, in, but with an ecclesiastical chain of command behind it. And that put Steve Christensen in a very difficult position. Um, so you think it was the money link, and, well, and really that Steve Christensen didn't necessarily know they were forged. Steve knew that Mark had offered that papyrus fragment, which was supposed to be part of the McClellan collection, to uh, other people. And he may have viewed that as selling the collateral for the bank loan. We don't think that Steve knew there was forgery because evidently he intended to go through with the McClellan transaction. He was doing everything he could to, to make it go through. He'd had his name put on the check of the buyer along with Mark's name so that that check would go to the bank. He'd rented safety deposit boxes so that the McClellan collection would go in there. You know, he, he wanted it to happen. And very briefly, do you believe that Kathy Sheets was killed just as a diversion to cover up the Steve Christensen Basically, murder? yes. Yeah. Talk about, we'll continue. Stay with us. Join us for Talk About. Call KSL 5678 for your free reservations. Groups and clubs are welcome. Call KSL 5678. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. The broadcasters of your area, in voluntary cooperation with federal, state, and local authorities, have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of an emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, the attention signal you just heard would have been followed by official information, news, or instruction. This station serves the Salt Lake City area. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. John's not exactly Mr. Decision. Now he's really got a problem. For years he's been eating the famous tortilla chips. You know, the ugly bag. He loves their hearty corn flavor for dipping or with my nachos. So now, the famous comes out with new nacho cheese flavored tortilla strips. New shape, thinner, crispier, great, right out of the bag. But he can't decide his favorite. So what does he do? Right hand chips, left hand strips. Beautiful. What I wanted was money and the things that it can buy, but I also wanted a job that I could respect in an industry that has respect. That's what Teller Training Institute is all about, training you to do the job as a professional in a professional environment. Without Teller Training Institute's training and placement service, I'd be beating my head against the wall and dead end job. Now I have a future in the banking industry and the money to do the things that I want. To start your career in banking, call the number at the bottom of your screen. We're talking about the uh, effects of Mark Hoffman, and one of those has been a certain amount of impact on uh, Mormon church history. What do you think that impact is, Alan? I think uh, a lot of people now are researching very early Mormon history, even before the church was organized, and that's probably been a result of Mark's documents. And so this acceleration 
uh, he created, and ironically, they're based on forged documents, but I don't think it's going to be abated. There'll be more and more books, articles, and studies coming out. Uh, I think a second impact will be that uh, historians and uh, people authenticating documents, uh, maybe the church at large will be much more skeptical when uh, new documents are found in the future that claim to, to have a new insight, or particularly a revisionistic uh, insight on Mormon history. Linda? What do you think about that? Well, I think that the impact on uh, contemporary history has been considerable, as Alan mentioned. It's hard to tell. History is an ongoing thing, and eventually um, the books and articles that have been written and influenced by those documents will be straightened out. But certainly the last five years, um, those documents have had a, a tremendous impact on the historians who have been busy um, researching them and giving papers and taking professional risks in order to keep their own integrity. And Brett Metcalf, as a, a friend and associate of Mark Hoffman, what was the, the impact on you personally because of your experience with Mark? Well, it's, it's really hard to even calculate that. I mean, it's, it's been an extremely devastating experience. You know, my, my love for, for both Steve and Mark has caused, you know, a, a great deal of emotional anxiety uh, for myself and for friends and family. And uh, I, uh, the, the one thing we can say for certain is that there have been many more victims than the people who Mark took their lives. If they had, if the media hadn't <coughs> received word from, of the plea bargain, do you think it would have had a greater effect? I think a groundswell of, of uh, angry outcry uh, could have occurred on the part of part of the community. As the poll has now retroactively shown, it's not a very popular movement. And frankly, the plea bargaining might have happened earlier, but, but leaks of it got out and they postponed it a couple of times. And there was anger amongst those putting it together that it would get out. But I don't think it would have influenced the actual plea, if that's what you're saying. I don't think it would have influenced the deal that was made. Very briefly, one, one last quick question. Do any of you know who the, the uh, or have a guess on who the intended third victim of the bomb was? Mark uh, uh, blew himself up with a bomb that was supposedly intended for someone else. Who was that victim? There are three theories, and very quickly, w theory one is that it was intended for another uh, collector, buyer of his, uh, whom he met with. A second possibility is, is that he intended to blow up his own car, claiming that the McClellan collection was in the trunk. It was burned up, and therefore he couldn't produce it for the church, and so let, give me leniency on the loan. And the third possibility is that uh, he may have been trying to commit suicide. And I'm not sure it's any of those three. Maybe it's even another one. I'm sure he'll be telling them if he hasn't already told them what, what it is. I wish we had more time. Thank you very much to each of you for coming and sharing in our conversation. Brent Metcalf, also Alan Roberts, and Linda Silito. Can't wait for your book to come out. If you'd like to come and be part of our Talk About audience, then I would call us KSL 5678. And I hope you join us for tomorrow's Talk About. We'll uh, talk to radio talk show host. Join us for that. Good morning. High schools, that being South High School.